consummate professionalism as always from me. Um, I'm actually going to do this up because, uh, oi, because I am professional and this is my sort of corporate look. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> it's a, a, I'm being serious. Um, I've got my little uh, tetralogical sticker, which is uh, who I work for. I actually walk around, I, I go to this conference called CSUN um, each year, which is the California State something something. Um, it, it's an accessibility conference, disability conference, and I walked around like that the whole time. I actually met somebody um, who had a similar jacket on and she stuck the... Uh, the sticker on the same way. I've got a lovely picture of her and me. Now I'm sounding like bloody, um, oh, bloody Trump now. Anyway, <laughs> no industry for old men. Uh, this is something that, that I was made aware of recently. It says, links from a semi-retired acquaintance and former colleague. Um, I won't reveal who, who that is, but let's just call him Joe. Joe Humbert, exactly. But anyway, this is the sort of casual ageism. And the reason why it's semi-retired was because I had worked for TPGI where Ian works um, for 18 years and I left there and now I'm working at, where am I working at? Tetralogical, that's right. <laughs> I'm working at Tetralogical and um, well, I'm actually one of the four directors of Tetralogical, so I have some sort of stake in it. But so I'm, I'm definitely not semi-retired, even though, as I'll say, uh, former colleague, yeah, we used to work together. Joe's a nice guy, um, but... Oh, wait there. Okay. So, <laughs> here's another comment from another friend, friend, acquaintance, friend who, um, <laughs> no, he's one of my closest friends. Um, I, I won't mention who he is, but let's just call him Patrick. Just give him a name, <laughs> okay? People, uh, I, I mentioned to him when I was just talking here today, and he said, this was his response. People who are shit but think they're great and have valuable things to say, share. So that's an example of an imposter syndrome trigger. I mean, I'm, I, I, Always tell everyone that I'm shit at. Um, sorry, can you say shit? I, I don't know. I wasn't given a. Anyway, I always tell people that I'm not good at, at speaking and I'm not. But anyway, so the point is while it may be the case that my best work is in the past, I mean, I'm old, I'm 60, I've just turned 60. Um, I am not dead yet. And I continue to work for a full time. Okay, so. Starting the prehistory, this is me in 1987. I was working Greenpeace for the time and I had a thing around one of those bike chains around my neck. And we were obviously, uh, the uh, MV Greenpeace had been taken by the Russians and there's me uh, risking my life. So anyway, I was born in Australia, 10 pound poms. Does everybody know that, what 10 pound poms are? People that, that got an assisted package pa passage to Australia for 10 quid. So my father was a tool maker. We went across there. I was educated in Australia. I went to uni in the 1980s. The only reason why I went to uni was because it was free at the time in Australia. And because I come from a poorer background, they um, actually paid me to go to university, so I appreciated that. I lived in Katoomba in the 90s, I worked in social care. I got a part-time job in Manly and then in Singapore where I learned to HTML. I went to UK in 99 and became a contract web dev. Now, I must admit that this was at a time when if you could spell HTML, they gave you a job. <laughs> so, anyway, and then I went back to Australia in 2001 after a couple of years here, and this is where my accessibility journey started. Sorry, did I mention that I'm, I'm uh, entrenched within uh, accessibility? Now, why is it not? Ah, there. So just 
December 2001, I um, started working at a charity called, or a non-government organisation called Vision Australia. I knew next to nothing about accessibility, but these two people on the, on the left, uh, this is my boss, a guy called Andrew Arch, who now works for an organisation in Australia called Intopia. It's also a guy called Russ Weekly works there, so you may have heard of him because he's quite cool. Um, I got sat down and I, I got given a paper copy of the work web content. God. So this was, yeah, this was back in the 2000s. So, and I was told to read it. And, uh, which I duly did. Um, and it was actually, I was about 60 pages at the time. This is my boss's boss, but also my, so, so by, he was my boss boss, I suppose. Yeah. Um, he says, our aim is to put ourselves out of business. And in, at this point in time, that was um, the uh, starry-eyed idea was that we could just, you know, do this accessibility stuff for a, a year or two. Everybody will know it. Everybody will take it on board and uh, carry on. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in business now. Um, and at the time, uh, I mean, when I first started, I was a dickhead. Well, I was still a dickhead, but I was more of a dickhead then. And this is one of my colleagues, and they used to have stupid, you know, arguments about stuff. And one of the arguments is, you don't need a space in alt to signify empty alt. So, and I said, yes, you do. <laughs> Turns out I was wrong, Sophia was right at the time. Um, and so, She's right. Um, you, don't need alt, you, don't, you don't even need an alt attribute um, to signify MD alt because if you just put an uh, image in there without... No, you don't need the equals and the things. You do need an alt attribute. Yeah, sorry. See, I told you, you'll come out more confused. <laughs> um, so you do. You need an alt. So there's an article and you can... If you feel the desire, I have a, a um, website and I have, uh, this is an article all about alt tag emptiness and you know, the various, how it actually works. Um, that is the picture, I don't know if I, no, I haven't mentioned it, but I do web standards merchandise. Um, and this is an example of a mug that says, say alt tag again and with, uh, well-known retro, rep, reprobate, or, yeah, uh, Adrian, Adrian Vaselli, who's got a really nice cursor um, tattoo, which he doesn't actually have, but he, yeah, he put it on there for some reason. Uh, okay, so that was the prehistory end, and this is W33C start. Now, again, accessibility is fun. Just remember, well, if you remember nothing else, remember that. Um, and if you remember that, get the shirt. <laughs> From HTMLZ Etsy shop. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? I was, well, I was going to telling myself that I should stop saying um. I don't know if you've ever noticed, it, but in, in, like I've noticed this over the years, so it, in some, some people, especially people that were enthralled with XML and XHTML tend to use this sort of start and end of with uh, like it like it was a um, an element and so I thought yeah I, I like that idea so I've taken it so they you know they'll write something they'll write a response to some email um, on a mailing list and they'll go you know end of conversation or some bullshit like that so that's what I'm doing. So ways to contribute to accessibility at the W3C. Who has ever been contributed to anything at the W3C? So a fair amount of people. Who, who has found it a frustrating and <laughs> horrible experience? Yes, well, it is frustrating, but it's, there is fun to be had. So there's many ways you can um, 
do it. You can file issues on repositories. You can comment on issues. You can file PRs, pull requests, comment on PRs, join a community group, join a working group. So uh, of those people, how many people are currently involved? Yeah, okay. So um, it's an interesting place to be involved in. And I was thinking, because I, I walk my dog around where I live in Kingston, which is in South West London. And I was, I was walking past some people who were talking about themselves being, um, you know, they were talking about football uh, or some sport and how, you know, they, they were sort of in depth about it. And I was thinking, being involved in this shit is very much the same as being involved. Uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's a hobby. And we, you know, it's something to do and it keeps our minds and you can sort of analyze stuff. So I, despite the fact that most people think that it's not that much fun, it is worthwhile doing. And the good thing about it is that these days you can interact or you can contribute to the level that you feel comfortable at. So I'm a member of, by dint of my organization, which is, which used to be TVGI, now, um, uh, sorry, I just got a flash in the eye. Um, used to be TPGI, now Tetralogical. As a, are both members of the W3C, and so I could enjoy, I enjoy, I can join any working group, and I do, but I just sort of sit there and, and watch a lot of stuff. So I've got to the point now where I don't really want to contribute much. <laughs> Not contribute, I, do, I just find that, that being across every everything is just it's I'm getting old it 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 um it's too much energy and I did it for years and years and years and so I sort of stepped back and I think that's partially why Humberto um said that uh, I was semi-retired because last year I for about 10 years or more I was um editing a number of specifications one of them, oh, I'll talk about that later. But I was editing specifications and then I decided to uh, step down as editor because there were people doing better work on it than me. And that people, person, was really a guy called, oh, now, now I can't remember. <laughs> Scott O'Hara. There you go. I don't know what, what, there's something odd, like music coming out. I've been watching, um, Rewatching, uh, what's it called? Battlestar Galactica. It's when the people find out they're Cylons because they're listening. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to spoil it for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> when they're listening to the walls, and I can hear music now. I don't know where it's coming from. It's not coming from there. All right, moving swiftly on. Please do join. Please get involved. You could just go and and and. Uh, and comment on a, on a particular thing. What, one of the things I like to do now is through my social media, my multi-platform social media empire uh, marketing machine is I like to uh, share interesting topics of discussion, um, threads that are going on, and that brings people out of the woodwork, which is always good, because there's nothing better than seeing Somebody asks a question or somebody make a statement and then all these grumpy old people are piling on. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, you could just subscribe to the mailing list if you want. If you just want to really to know about what, what, what's going on in web standards and accessibility standards in particular, you can do that. One of the things I, that I would um, suggest is know when you don't know. That is... You, one of the frustrating things is that that people who know next to nothing or think they know a lot more than they do tend to be the loudest. So, and I was the same um, when I was a youngster or younger, but now I'm not. So it's important, yeah, because you can this. I don't know, I didn't know where I got, got this from, but it's like the circles of hell, but the, your area of expertise in the middle and this person, uh, let's call him Joe, or Patrick, or not Joe, 
sorry, uh, yeah, people think, because I've got a couple of people I work with, Joe and Alistair, hello, um, that it's not Joe, it's Joe Humbert I'm talking about, not you at all, Joe. Uh, so, one of the things is you'll encounter all different types of people. So, these are, I know, these are some of the examples that you've also find on Slack and Web Aim and LinkedIn or whatever, Zitter, Mastodon. Is the well-meaning people. Um, you'll, you'll also know they, they all look like uh, Klingons, um, but the, the, they're actually all... Then there's the argumentative people. Then there's the people with an axe to grind. There's lots of people there with an axe to grind. Uh, the practical. It's always good to have practical people in there. The clueless. And as I said, they're one of the loudest of all. <laughs> then you've got the old school people like myself. Um, Helpful. It's always good to be helpful, even if you argue and get someone's point. The true believers, the people that just believe <laughs> that uh, web standards are next to godliness. Um, and the revisionists, there are the people that want to rewrite the normative definitions of things all over the place because they don't disagree with them. And unfortunately, yeah, it does happen that you get to rewrite stuff, but it involves putting out a new specification. You can't just rewrite the old in, uh, in the way that you want. And then there are the lurkers, and there's lots of lurkers. And I, I would urge you, if you do nothing, lurk. <laughs> it's like Dave. OK, so that's W3C end. WCAG start. OK, how am I doing for time? Seven minutes. Oh, fuck. Look, I. <laughs> I always do this. I, I, I'm the exact opposite of my uh, good friend uh, Lloydie, who, who, who revises and, and rehearses and, and does all these things and works out the timings. I've got like 60 slides. I'm not going to get through them. Uh, again, best thing is to know your standards. Know and know the, the, the core, like go to the source. Don't believe some some secondary source because they're almost always going to be out of date or well, even <laughs> some of the primary sources are out of date. But it's a good thing to know HTML, ARIA, CSS and WCAG in this case. So one of the things about consistency, this talking about WCAG in particular, WCAG 1, and this is, as I mentioned, I was around when I was, I was using it, that Auto checks, so I mean the difference between what you need to manually test versus you know, the use of these wonderful automated tools that everybody touts, especially the larger companies, um, was that uh, auto checks is about 30% of the WCAG success criteria that you can be tested with. And of that 30%, even they, they still need, they need to be interpreted. 70% is manual testing. So WCAG 2 comes along. It's about the same amount. And then I'll always get when I do this and people will come, where did you get that 30% from? How do you know? I'm not going to argue about stupid statistics. But anyway, <laughs> even though I like to use them. WCAG 2.1, very similar. WCAG 2.2, it always seems to be like that. Um, then... <laughs> I'm not going to mention where that comes. Then my mind got blown, as, as you can imagine that my mind gets blown quite often. Um, I love that gif, gif, whatever. Um, I read on a website of a large corporation, accessibility corporation, we analysed 30,000 pages, page states, nearly 300,000 issues, and found that 57% of issues for first-time audit customers could be found using automated testing. I'm thinking, all right, that's, a, that's like almost double. And the question is, how was this achieved? From a consistent 30 to 50 percent, almost double. Yep, they turned it up to 11. Um, what, part of what they did was change the way the percentage is calculated. So the old way, the way that everybody else seems to use is total number of success criteria, which depending on what uh, is currently is about 60 odd or something. I can, I can never remember, 55. 
A and double A success criteria. The new was the number of instances of issues found on the auto testable criterion. So that's how they, versus the, the so it was, a, it was a matter of auto testable checks versus um, non, so manual checks. And so they could find, of the instances of issues. So I was just, you know, I thought, what, why am I doing this anymore? I mean, the, these tools are just amazing. Okay, so there's a certain irony in this because when you, uh, the deep, so what happened, talking about re revisionist, what happened in, in YK 2.2 was this, this, this particular um, success criterion called 4.1.1 parsing and it was found that, well, essentially it wasn't well written to start with and then as the years gone by, it just became defunct, really. I mean, it was, it was, there was never any, or, well, yeah, I won't go into that. Anyway, it got obsoleted, okay, from, from all, um, including, uh, including 2.2, way of 2.2. So um, it was removed from the calculation. If you remove from, from the, the stats that they provide, if you remove, <laughs> remove the Wakehag, the parsing criteria, it's the, the percentage of, of, even in the new way, the percentage is still 30, 31%. So they've actually had an improvement of 1%, not 30%. And <laughs> not naming the company, but let's just call it DQ. <laughs> or deck or whatever it is. Um, I, and I put that there because there, this is the table that I used and it's still there so people can, there is a link to it. I'll make the slides available. How much longer have I got, Dave? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So we've got uh, 30 odd slides to get through. No, 40 <laughs> slides to get through five minutes. So the point being here is that automated tools are still are, are helpful and sometimes useful, but they you still need people looking at the issues and people that understand the issues. Anyway, way hand, title attribute start. I'll get through the title attribute, so don't disturb me. It's it's gonna be <laughs> um, again, lovely hat. This is my uh, wow way hag uh, line. Um, People actually bought that. So <laughs> anyway, back in 2005, I, it was my first um, time I ever uh, did a talk. And that was in Australia at a thing called Web Essentials, which is a precursor of web directions. Um, and so do users, and I asked the question, do users with disabilities, the whole thing is about the title attribute. But, at the time, I thought, this is really obscure and nobody's going to be interested, but it's been something that people have continued to be interested in and wrote about in different, different contexts. So um, at the time, I asked, do you use with disabilities read or hear the title text? I, I wrote an article in 2013, which I was, is up on the TBGI blog, and I talked about user groups not well served by the title attribute, and there's a whole slew of them. So it's always been problematic uh, as because of the nature of, of, of how it's um, displayed amongst many other things. So there was no, there's been no ch or very limited change over a period of time. And one of the things that I did, at, at one point I was, um, I think, when you, uh, yeah, at one point I was uh, editor of the HTML5 spec at the W3C. I think Bruce was at one point, yeah, as well. But minutes, yeah. yeah, about 10 minutes. Well, it was about 40 minutes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, that I, uh, and during that time, about 2010, I wrote to the, um, I wrote to the browser people at the time because I had their ear because I was doing this this work, and I said, 
do, do, will you commit to implementing um, the title attribute on focus? Because that's one of the things you, it, unless, unless you, you know, can use um, a mouse, you can't see it. Uh, and most of them said, nah, no, so it, was, it was really, we can't commit no thing. Apple said, oh, we can't commit to doing anything. And, um, and Microsoft said much the same thing. Uh, but anyway, so did this happen? Well, not really. And uh, that's so, it's been like 14, yeah, 14 years. If you have a look at the, the what w HTML specification, or the HTML specification, I was to say, 2023, there is a note in, in there about relying on the title attribute is currently discouraged as many user agents do not expose the attribute in accessible man, which is all true. That was in there, put in there 12 years ago. It's still the same today, or very similar. As always, the, if I am, if I want to say something about these things, I always want to check stuff. So what I did the other day, or the other last week, and I wrote an article about it, which you can read on my blog, hcm5xsme.com forward slash stuff, <laughs> but the link is there, which I'll make these slides available. Is the title attribute content displayed when interactive elements receive focus? So in 2024, the situation is, Chrome actually does this, so if you move onto an input, it'll display the uh, title attribute. The rest of them, no. Nah. <laughs> so, uh, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, and this is just desktop. So, t the um, talking about touch devices, mobile, whatever, it's it's much the same. But the more details in there. So the answer is no. So from 2005, when I was banging on about it, to 2000, how many is that? That's 19 years? <laughs> Still not a viable way <laughs> to accessibly or um, provide information to, you, to a user. So in 2023, and this says thanks to Hitty because I was looking at, at work he'd done on the popover, um, that it, that you, a new method or a different way to provide a um, a visible label is is by using the popover attribute, and yes, reheat his stuff more uh, about it because um, I think that he covers things a lot better than I do. Um, so one of the things that I found, and you, please do correct me, Hitty, if I'm wrong, the popover doesn't show on hover and focus by default, yeah? So that's, you know, that's a potential issue. Um, but what I did find, oh no, 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 no. What I did find was just through the addition of um, some simple JavaScript, no, sorry, simple CSS. You see, that's, that's the problem with using uh, <laughs> um, ChatGPT. You start to get, you know, because you, you get a, a code block and it says JavaScript when it's actually CSS. So, so anyway, using this, you can, um, you can, it, we can create a, uh, a popover that is shown as well as on, um, as well as on, on uh, mouse uh, enter or whatever, or mouse click there, you can get shown on uh, hover and focus. So that's one issue uh, that, uh, I, I don't know, does anybody know what this is? What? Some CSS? No, not <laughs> this. <laughs> you, <laughs> out. <laughs> Back of the bus. No, um, the, because the reason why I've got this, this icon is I looked at the, when I was creating these examples, um, the icon was, <laughs> The, I, I picked it and I thought, oh, that looks interesting. Um, so the other thing is, is the popover content not uses the act name by default, okay? So one of the things, being an accessibility wonk, um, fascist, some people say, uh, I look at, so the button, the button has, you know, an icon and it, it needs an accessible name. The accessible name is, is the, 
name that is um, provided in the accessibility tree. So when a, a uh, screen reader or something goes, uh, hits focus on it, it'll announce what the accessible name is. So I was thinking, in the case of these, these, uh, you know, so pseudo um, title ad, title displays, tooltips, it would be perfect if the uh, if the content within the um, within the popover, the popover content would be the accessible name for it. So I thought, okay, well, this is, I'm I'm using a button. And so I should just be able to put a label in there and that will become the accessible name for it. So we've got a label for, this is a bong. It's, it's a, a bong, by the way, if you oh. didn't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know why that they have that as an icon, but anyway. Um, I thought it was one of those, one of, one of those things that you... No, no, it's... <laughs> We'll do the charades later. Um, but anyway, uh, and so I, I wrote this, and, and then I thought, and then I looked at, in the accessibility tree, no accessible name. I was thinking, what the fuck is going on here? Um, then I re remembered that when a label element is used as an accessible name, if it's hidden, then it won't provide the accessible name. So once I focus on that and the thing comes up, the, uh, the popover comes up, then the accessible name, it will be, this is a bong. But there's not really much use um, because it relies <laughs> upon, it doesn't have an accessible name until it gets physically focused in the browser. Not much use at all. And I thought about this, I thought, well, what I wanted, you know, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of the first rule of ARIA, and that is um, use HTML unless you can't, essentially. Uh, and I thought I really wanted to use standard HTML, but then, but I remember why this wasn't happening is because it was hidden. But then what I found is if I just put the label outside of the the popover, it doesn't show any, like it doesn't make any difference, it doesn't. It doesn't get displayed, but doing that, if the, if the content of the label is hidden, that's fine. As long as the visible label, then it will um, populate as an accessible name. I've got, uh, why has it got, oh, there. Okay, Copen, I've got a whole slew of them that I've done, because also I was looking at um, why, it's fine on desktop, but how does how does popover work for um, touch devices? And, and it seems it has a problem in the, the you know if you've got a button that you want to have the accessible the uh, the label for it, you don't want to have to push the button in order to see the label. But you can't really all oh, you don't. There is a conflict between pushing the button and, and doing the thing it wants to do and showing the label. Whereas if you're um, using a mouse or whatever, you don't have that problem. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of uh, collection, there's a collection of co-pen shit that I did that goes through this. So the other way that, that you could do it is using the ARIA, is ARIA label by. Um, and that doesn't, then it doesn't matter whether the thing's hidden or not. So there are a number of ways, but Provide an accessible name. So, you're going to miss out on accessibility dreaming, I'm sorry, because this, this, but title attribute end and accessibility dreaming. And I did have a dream back in um, 2010. And uh, it was that, that uh, accessible HTML would be a beautiful thing. And that's why I started working on this. Um, and Eventually it became this, and then I lost interest. Uh, <laughs> well, it did. It, it, it's everything. It served its purpose. From 2010 to 2023, I think, shit got a lot better as far as this stuff was concerned. Um, and the, my interest is specifically in how browsers um, implement accessibility semantics. 
So, I, yeah, I'll just go through quickly because <laughs> you see all the... Ah, uh, yeah. Here's me and Lionel. This guy, Lionel, is... Um, this was in TPAC last year. I'm hoping to see him again this year. I've got another shirt to wear with him. This guy uh, is, w works for... Uh, um, what is it? Userway. The one that was bought by somebody. And I was going to talk about uh, how I use AI... I don't use it accessory testing. I was going to talk about, um, uh, but I, I wanted to get to this to say, this is for David Swallow. <laughs> He's inspirational, along with Patrick, as you can see there, they're, they're friends of mine. I wouldn't be where I am today without them. Thank you. <laughs>